This morning we are in the Gospel of Luke, and as we look at the Gospel of Luke today, we're going to be in chapter 17. When we get into chapter 17, we see uh, Jesus laying out some requirements, some obligations for those who are called to follow him, those who are truly Christ followers. And what we really see this morning and what I want to talk about is our responsibility before God. The way we are to respond to a loving, gracious, merciful God who has poured out his love into our lives, who laid his life down that we could know him. I want to start by going uh, through our memory verse that I gave you last week. And you know, I really hope that you are putting these in your heart and that you're learning the word of God as you memorize it, that you would be meditating on it and thinking through it and seeking how to apply it. I asked you last week to memorize Luke chapter 9 verse 25. Luke 9, 25. So if you memorize that, will you please uh, say it with me? For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? What does it gain? Nothing. Nothing. There's, there's no gain in gaining the world. Having the world by the tell, if you forfeit your own life, if you lose your very soul, the most important relationship that you will ever have isn't with your mama, it's not with your daddy, it's not with your siblings, it's not with your spouse, it's not with your children. The most important relationship that you will ever have is with our holy God. It's about knowing him and loving him and growing in a real relationship with this God who sent his only son. Jesus warned the Pharisees, man, he was hard on them in chapter 16 about their love of money. We saw that from verse 14 all the way through verse 31. And now he turns his attention to his disciples to warn them about causing people to stumble. I mean, there are addresses that he lays out here. And, you know, we live in a sinful world that is filled with sinful people. And it's difficult at times to understand when you're really doing the right thing or when you're, when you're a stumbling block. But we need to, to be warned as well, not to cause other people to stumble. It's a serious thing to cause a believer to be drawn into temptation or to fall into sin. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 14, verse 13, he said, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. The phrase any longer means that this was something that was being dealt with. It was something that was going on within the body of Christ. And he said, we shouldn't be passing judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide, make a decision. Decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Now, when we talk about stumbling block, uh, the, the best way for me to understand it visually is to think about something in your way that you might trip over or that you might fall over. It's something that causes someone else to stumble or to fall. And as believers, our responsibility is to honor God. It's imperative that we're careful not to cause other people to stumble, to stumble by the way we live our lives, by the way we communicate, by the example we set. So don't be a stumbling block. Jesus says right here in Luke 17, verse 1 and 2, and he said to his disciples, he's talking to the crowd, dealing with the Pharisees, and now he turns his attention to his disciples. And he said to his disciples, temptation to sin are sure to come. Of course they are. We live in a fallen world. Temptations are everywhere. Temptation to sin are sure to come. But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Jesus it's laying out the obligation that we have before God and before others as followers not to cause people to sin. I mean, this life is filled with sin, and sin will not be eradicated until we are with Jesus. There will always be sin. There will always be a struggle with it. It's something that we have to deal with and we have to work through in this world. 
People will do things that will hurt you, and you will do things that will hurt others because we live in a broken world. But as believers, we need to be responsible for our actions. Even when it comes to temptation, the bottom line is it falls on us. We are all responsible for the way we act and the way we live. But Jesus says, woe to him that causes one of these little ones, somebody who's little, meaning not that they're small, but that they're young in their faith. It's important and imperative that we understand that we are to be a living witness. You know, we're supposed to be an example to the world of what it really means to know Jesus and follow him. Now, Sin is, is a tough thing, but you have to understand that you have a personal responsibility, first of all, with your own sin, not to give in to sin. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 13, that when tempted, no one should say that God is tempting me. And I've heard people say, why is God doing this to me? Listen, we should never blame God for our own sin or our own temptation. God doesn't tempt us. He doesn't tempt anyone. Verse 14 says in James chapter 1, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own. By whose desires? By your spouse's desires, by your children's desires, but no, by your own desires. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The wages of sin is death. Sin always leads to death. As Christ followers, we have to stay away from it, first of all, ourselves, and then we have to be careful not to cause other people to fall into sin, not to be a bad example. He says, better a millstone. You say, well, what's a millstone? It's a really heavy stone that was used for grinding out grain. So they would use these big stones to grind the grain, and they would run. It says, better that a millstone be tied around your neck and you thrown into the bottom of the ocean. Better that you were dead. Hear me. This is serious. Better that you were dead than to be a stumbling block. I mean, those are harsh and heavy words. They're serious. The word here for harm, when it talks about spiritual harm, it's where we get the word scandalize from. It means to cause to sin, to, to lead somebody into sin. You say, well, I would never do that. I would never lead. But we do it with our attitude and our actions without even realizing at times. I remember talking to a young man who was struggling with porn. I said, man, how did it get so bad? He said, when I was a kid, he said, I, you know, my dad had been at the computer all day who was a professing believer, a Christ follower. And he said, and he got up and went away, and I went and sat at the computer. He said, and there it was. It was just right in front of me. Stumbling block. And the stuff that we do that people are watching and seeing in our lives. Listen, when you have a bad attitude, don't think your children don't notice. I mean, Acts 1.8 says, and you shall be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. It starts at home. It starts in the way we live in front of our children. Your children should think that you are the most Christ-like person they know. Bottom line. Because they know you the most. They see you the most. They should see Jesus in you at every turn, in every circumstance, in every situation. They should see Christ in the way you respond with your attitude. When you're negative and you're complaining about somebody else, don't think your kids aren't picking up on that. When you're grumbling about the way this happened, the way that happened, don't think your kids aren't picking up on that. When you're angry, man, when you live with anger or bitterness towards other people, not only your children see that, but all the people that, that know you. That's a stumbling block. We're supposed to represent Christ with our actions and our attitudes. We need to pay attention to our conversations and our conduct before the world. Because the world is watching. 
And our job is to be the light and the salt of the earth. And I know that in churches, we don't talk a lot about being stumbling blocks. But the reality is that often our attitude isn't becoming of Christ. It isn't always reflecting him. And we need to be careful before the world. I mean, especially with people who are young in their faith. We have to be a witness. And even if it hurts, you got to keep it down. Even if you're angry, you got to deal with it. When you get explosive or start cursing, don't think your kids and your friends don't see that. I remember a friend of mine who told me, yeah, man, I'm really working on being a stumbling block. and I I'm, I'm, don't want to be this in front of my kids. I really want to be a good example. And the other day we were outside working and God gave me an opportunity. He said, I hit my thumb with a hammer. He said, I was working on the house and man, I hit my thumb with a hammer. And he said, in the words that came out of my mouth, he said, I was like, and he said, then I realized that my son was sitting right there. So what do you do in a situation like that? You ask for forgiveness. See, that's the right thing. He said this, I mean, and then he communicated the truth. He's like, look, I don't want to be a stumbling block. I'm sorry for the way, first of all, I dishonored Christ and the way I spoke in front of you. Listen, when you're sharp with other people in front of people, that's not Christ-like. When you're condescending or putting people down, even if you're joking, it's not Christ-like. It's critical for us as believers not to be a stumbling block and to pay attention to our words, to pay attention to our lifestyle, to pay attention to our actions and our attitudes that the world might see Christ in us. The second thing you have to realize is that as believers, and this is our obligation, our responsibility, is that we have to we have to be forgiving. Don't live with unforgiveness. I mean, Jesus starts off verse 3 with, pay attention to yourself. Have a checkup from the neck up, man. Evaluate yourself. Examine your heart. Look at what's going on in your life. See, it's really easy to look at everybody else. It's really easy to say, oh, well, so-and-so does this, and he does that, or she does this. or he. But what about looking at your own life? And evaluating your own attitude, evaluating the way you communicate, evaluating the way you handle yourself in tough or dire situations. It's easy to be a witness when life is smooth, when you got your ice cream and your cake. But life's not always that way. And if you want to know what's really on the inside, just watch what comes out when you're squeezed. When you're under pressure. When life is hard, pay attention to your thinking. Is it biblical? Is it honoring to God? The Bible says take each thought captive. It didn't say, oh, it's okay not to take your thoughts captive when you're in hard times. It says take your thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ, ready to punish each act of disobedience. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. We need to pay attention to what's going on in our lives with our own sin so that we are not causing others to stumble. But not only that, that we are forgiving to others. He says, pay attention to yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And this sin in context is against you. Not just like you're the sin police and you're looking around like, oh, no. Oh, wait, wait. No. Hey, man, don't do that. You're not the sin police. The Holy Spirit, that's his job, all right? He's the one in charge of our sin. But when somebody sins against you, pay attention to yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you, here it is in context, against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Not only are Jesus' followers not to cause others to stumble, they are also to counteract sin by forgiving others for their sin against them. 
Now, if a brother sins against you, you are to confront him. And when we live in a, this is a, a tough thing in this world, right? Because we live in a world where we have a, generations of people who are afraid to offend anybody or afraid that they might hurt their feelings or afraid to say the truth. But we're always called to speak the truth in love. And if somebody sins against you, you have a responsibility to go to that person. If they sin against you, that is your responsibility. You can't say, oh, but I don't want to make them mad at me. Look, God doesn't say you get an exemption here. We have to do the tough things as believers, as Christ followers. So if somebody sins against you, you have to go to them. Even if they sin to, against you over and over and over. The whole seven times in a day denotes completeness. Seven is the number of completion. And as, what it means is as often as it happens, it's not like a limit. All right, hey, hey, seven times, you're done for the day. That's it. You know, you got your seven in. Now I can be bitter at you. Now I can be angry at you. You know, that's not what it means. So how do you deal with people who sin against you? What's the proper biblical model to confront somebody who sins against you? Well, Matthew 18, Jesus laid that out. He says in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, and this is the way we should operate in the body of Christ. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So if somebody sins against you, don't go to your friends and your neighbors and talk to other people about them sinning against you. If somebody directly sins against you, you need to directly go to that person. You know? And that, that, that can be challenging. But you've got to do that when it comes to sin. If he listens to you, look what it says. You have gained your brother. Now, this is dealing with sin. You've got to make sure that that person is really sinning against you. But that's a serious matter to confront somebody on sin in that relationship. Look, I sin against my wife all the time. And my wife sins against me all the time. It just happens. We get mad at each other. We say things we shouldn't say. Or we get our feelings hurt, you know? And, and we constantly have to go to each other and say, hey, look, you sinned against me. This really offended me. You attacked my character. And that's not cool. Because how many times do we get into an argument with our spouse and instead of dealing with the issue, what do we do? Character assassination. We're like, well, you're always this way. Shh, shh, shh. You lie. You do this. You do that. And we just slice each other up. When you get into an issue with somebody, don't attack their character. Deal with the issue. Work it out as best as possible as long as it depends. That's what the Bible says. To live at peace with all people. To the best of your ability. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. So if somebody sins against you, it says you have gained your, you've got him back. Because now you're, you're intimate in that relationship where you can share honestly and truthfully with each other. Because he'll repent if he hears you, if he sinned against you. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. That every charge, and listen to me, it's a serious thing to charge somebody in sin. That they are in sin. Now, there might be things that people do that you don't like, but that doesn't mean they're in sin. There's a difference. You have to understand that. If I don't like the way you comb your hair, and I want to address that, I'm allowed to address that. I'm allowed to say, Luther, I don't like the way you comb your hair. And he would say, what hair? And I'd say, I just don't like the way you comb it. That, that would be like a personal issue. That, that has nothing to do with sin. It's got nothing to do with something he's doing that is sinful towards me. That's just personality and preference. And you, you're allowed to talk about things like that. You can do that. In real relationships, you can say, hey, I don't like the way you do this. But that's not the same as sin. When somebody sins against you and they don't listen, they won't repent, then you take somebody else. Why? Because this can become a matter of church discipline. That's a serious thing. Nobody ever wants to hear that, but go read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There's a time when you turn people over to Satan. That their bodies might be destroyed, that their souls might reap eternal life. 
because they won't repent from their sin. There's a difference. Preference, personality, those kind of things are not sinful. When somebody sins against you, you have a responsibility to go to that person. And then if they won't hear you, take one or two along with you. That every charge, because it's a charge, may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Because as believers, we are responsible to live a holy life. Hear me, sin's not something you play with. We are called to be holy in all that we do. First Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 15 says to be holy as he is holy in all that we do. Our goal as Christ followers should never be to embarrass or hurt the offender. If somebody sins against you, you shouldn't be trying to ridicule them or put them down for their sin. But you should encourage them because your desire as a believer should want, you should desire restoration. That they are reconciled back to God. We have the ministry of reconciliation according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right? He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And when somebody is living in sin, they're not in a right relationship with God or people. I mean, what did John say, you know? If you live in the darkness because he's in the light, you can't have fellowship with God or with one another. But if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you and all unrighteousness. So we should never want to ridicule anybody we should desire that they would repent and do what's right galatians chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 kind of puts it this way brothers if anyone is caught in any transgression transgression is another word for sin you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness the picture in the greek here is mending a broken leg somebody's laying on the side of the road and they can't move they can't walk they can't they can't live life. It's the broken. It's what happens when a believer lives in sin. When a believer lives in sin, he is broken. He's no good to anybody or to God. He's not a witness. And she's a bad witness. We're always a witness, <laughs> good or bad. So this guy could be laying on the side of the road, and the picture here is to mend his leg and then to pick him up and to help him along. That's the picture here. We're to carry one another's burden. So it says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, though. This is critical. Paul adds this specifically for a reason. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. You say, well, how would I be tempted if somebody else is in sin? Easy. You can be bitter. You can be judgmental critical, angry at that person for their sin, instead of loving them right where they are, praying for them, lifting them up. When you see somebody in sin, your job is to pray for them, to love them, to encourage them, to build them up, to help them to get right with God. If they won't hear you, you take somebody else and look, we see this the sin in your life, and we want to deal with it. We want you to do what's right because you love that person. But you have to be careful that you're not falling into temptation because it's real easy to be judgmental or critical or harsh or unkind, to allow bitterness to grow up in your heart towards somebody because of sin. But he says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? It's the law of love. Love always wants what's best for the one loved. See, what's best for somebody when you love them is you want what's best for them. You want to encourage them. You want to build them up. You want to help them to be better. And if they're not in a right relationship with God, they're not in true fellowship with God or the body. And so if somebody is living in sin and you see it, and you're spiritual minded, you need to help that person. You need to encourage that person. Here's one of my favorite verses about unforgiveness because I believe that unforgiveness is one of the most critical issues of our heart today in the modern church. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender hearted. Man, that's an act of compassion. 
A lot of times we can be so stoic and so straight up that we don't show mercy and we don't show compassion to those who are hurting. Be kind to one another, tender to hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Who's our perfect example? Jesus. Jesus hanging on the cross, blood running down his face, his intestines hanging out, his back shredded like it's been on a shredder. From the cat of nine tails, his body is destroyed. <gasps> Gasping, man, pushing up with the pain in his feet and the pain in his lungs, the pain in his arms. Doesn't say you're going to get what's coming to you. One day you'll stand before me. He says, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And if that is our example, we have to live in forgiveness. Because when you hold on to something, it only hurts you. When you're bitter at somebody or angry at somebody or holding on to something towards someone, it only hurts you. Christ followers, we must be in the habit of forgiving all the time. People are going to sin against us. And of course, when Jesus said seven times in a day or 70 times seven, that's hyperbole. It's just to get a point across. I doubt somebody's going to sin against you 70 times. Maybe, but that would be a record, I think. 70 times seven and one, 490 personal sins against you. It's hyperbole to make a point that you don't count people's sins. Your job isn't to count other sins. Your job is to love them, and love keeps no records of wrong. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? Go read verses 4 through 6. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not rude, it is not proud, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. Love keeps no records of wrong wrongs it means you don't throw it back up in their face you don't use it over their head like i remember when you man you did this i remember you don't hold people's sins over them you forgive them now very important to understand though because i want you to understand that if somebody is abusing you doesn't mean that you have to stay in that situation. You can forgive a person, but you can forgive them from a distance. So if somebody is abusing you, you don't have to keep putting yourself back in that. You have to forgive them for whatever they've done to you. You have to forgive them because that frees you to be the person that God wants you to be. And it displays his love and forgiveness. But you don't have to keep putting yourself in that in that abuse. Sometimes we need to learn to set boundaries and say, I will not allow you to speak to me that way. I just won't. I will not allow you to treat me this way. I just won't. I'm done with it. And that's an important understanding in the Christian world because sometimes Christians, we believe we're supposed to be doormats. Like people are supposed to just walk all over us. And we let people talk to us however they want, treat us however they want. We say, yeah, but i got to be loving. Listen, being loving doesn't mean you put yourself in an abusive situation. Now, if they drag you out and beat you for your faith, hey, man, praise God. Right? Because you're just being a martyr. You're being a witness. There's no greater joy than to give your life for Jesus. When somebody's abusive, when somebody's wronging you, you have to forgive. I, I believe, and this is just for me, from what I've seen through my years in ministry, that the most dangerous sin in the church today is unforgiveness. People hold on to bitterness, and it's like a root that just chokes the life out of your heart. That people hold on to things that other people do or say. Man, God wants us to walk in freedom. 
when you're thinking and spending your mental energy remembering somebody something said or did or how they treated you, when you're holding on to that, and you let bitterness just choke the life out of you. So many believers don't walk in freedom because they're not willing to forgive. And forgiving doesn't mean you will forget. Hear me. Just because you forgive somebody doesn't mean you forget about it. So every time it comes back in your mind, you say, God, help me to walk in forgiveness. Help me to, to let it go, to lay it down, to cast all my burdens upon you because you care for me. And you bring it back to the cross and you lay it down until one day, guess what? You're not thinking about it anymore. Till one day it's not coming up in your mind. Till all of a sudden it's gone and you're free. Forgiveness is a process, but it starts immediately when you choose to say, God, I forgive them. I want to give this to you right here, right now. It's dangerous to hold on to things that God wants us to let go of. The third obligation is that we are to grow in our faith. We are called not to be a stumbling block. Very important in the way we conduct ourselves. And then we're called not to live with unforgiveness. We have to be forgiving. And then we have to learn to grow in our faith. Look, the disciples say, we can't do this. That's what they're thinking. They're like, there's no way. Hey, you got to increase our faith. If we're going to be able to forgive everybody, if we're going to be able to live this way. So they say to him, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Well, why would they ask that? Because they know that living in unforgiveness not being a stumbling block or things that are impossible to do. So we need more faith. So they say, increase our faith. And look how the Lord responds. And the Lord said, if you had, if you what? Had faith. If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Jesus is teaching his followers that they have a responsibility before God and before men, right? And the first responsibility here is that we need to grow in our faith, that we need to have faith. When the disciples asked for more faith, Jesus didn't say, well, let me just give you a little more faith. No, he says, if you had faith, meaning that if you had the right kind of faith, real faith, because we all use faith every day. When you sat in that chair, you ex exercised faith. You believed it would hold your backside up or you wouldn't have sat down. You know, you believed that your car would start when you stuck the key in it this morning. You exercised faith. You didn't go through a whole mental procession of internal combustion and how it all works and will the gas, you know, fire the engine and get the spark. And we're... You didn't think about all that. You exercised faith. We exercise faith every day. But it's not about just faith. It's about the object of our faith. Are you really trusting Jesus? See, it's the object of our faith that really matters. It wasn't that they needed more faith. They needed to transfer their object to Jesus. They needed to trust in Jesus. If they had the right kind of faith, and the right kind of faith is believing in Jesus. When the disciples asked Jesus for more faith, he answered them, if you had the faith of a mustard seed. Listen, a mustard seed is the smallest seed there is. And if you have that kind of faith, as small as a mustard seed, you could do amazing things for the kingdom of God. You could say to this mulberry tree, which is another hyperbole, he's not literally talking about casting trees into the ocean, but you could say to this mulberry tree, Pull yourself up and go plant yourself in the sea, and it would. Listen, it takes living faith, living faith to obey these instructions, to forgive others. Our obedience in forgiving others shows that we are trusting God. You're trusting God to take care of the consequences, to handle the possible misunderstandings, to work everything out for your good and his glory. You are trusting God. That takes faith. You believe that all things work together for the good of those who love him and have been called. If you believe that, you're exercising faith and you're not worried, you're not fearful, you're trusting. Mature Christians understand that forgiveness it's not a cheap exchange of words, like two kids playing on the playground. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let's shake on it. It's not what it is. 
True forgiveness always involves pain. That's right, pain. Somebody's been hurt. And there's a price to pay in healing a wound. Real forgiveness is painful. The reason we have forgiveness is because Jesus experienced pain. Amen? Jesus experienced so much pain so that we could be forgiven. And when you forgive people that have hurt you, it will be painful. The guy who raped you. The man who molested you. When you truly learn to forgive, it's painful. God wants us to walk in forgiveness, and we need faith to do that. And that's why they're asking for faith. Love motivates us to forgive, but faith activates that forgiveness. It's love that motivates us, but it's faith that gives us that ability. God wants to work in us, but we have to live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And you say, Scott, that's great and all, but I just can't forgive. You have to learn. You have to trust, and you need faith to do that. There's always, we live in a broken world. There's always going to be hurt, and people are going to hurt you for the rest of your life, and you're going to hurt them. It's the process of this life that we live in. People will hurt you and you will hurt them. But we have to get into the habit of facing the offenses honestly and lovingly and forgiving the people that hurt you. And you do that by faith. An Anglican pastor, a poet, George Herbert once wrote, He who cannot forgive breaks the bridge over which he himself must pass. If you can't walk in forgiveness, you'll never walk in fellowship. You see, and Satan knows that. He wants to keep you from living in real fellowship with God. And as long as you hold on to that bitterness, as long as you hold on to that anger, as long as you let that doubt grow in your heart, he wins. Listen, Jesus paid way too much a price for us to throw in the towel when it comes to living by faith. When people hurt you, forgive them. Love them right where they are. Trust God. Believe his word. All things. All things doesn't mean just a few things. It means everything in your life, the good, the bad, the ugly. That God is using it all because he's sovereign. He providentially is allowing these things to grow us and change us and shape us into the men and women that he wants us to be. And our job is to be faithful. That's our job, to learn to be faithful in the good and the bad. When life is easy and when life is so, so difficult, to be faithful. And until we learn to be faithful in the small things, we'll never be faithful in the big things. And in this process, we need to be growing in faith. And you say, well, how do I grow in my faith? Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's about that relationship with Christ. It's about trusting Christ. It's about applying his word to your life. And as you experience that life, that abiding life, it sets you free. There's real freedom in trusting him. Not trying to reconcile it all in your mind and figure it all out. Say, well, I think God is doing this. Man, get off that. Because you're never going to know the mind of God completely. You don't know what God is doing. Don't assume to know the mind of God. Like you think you know everything he's doing and why. Just trust him. Your job isn't to have it all figured out. Jesus says, and this is very eye-opening. Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep, say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table. Like you got your servant out there and he's cutting the grass, he's mowing the yard, he's doing everything, he's taking care of the sheep, 
And now he comes in, he's, uh, he's exhausted, he's worked 12 hours. You're like, hey man, just chill out at the table, let me feed you. No, that's not how it works. He says, will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, talking to the servant, prepare supper for me, dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink? And afterwards, you will eat and drink. Why? Because he's a servant and he's doing his job. That's the way it is. The servant is, that's unfair, Scott. I mean, that's not tolerable in our culture. We would never treat anybody that way. I mean, after every four hours, you have to have a 15-minute work break. How would we expect somebody to work all day long in the hot sun and then come in and, and not rest? Listen to me. A servant was called to serve. Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? Oh, thank you. You worked so hard today. You did such a great job. Man, those sheep, they've never looked so fine. You've sheared them so well. I mean, that is awesome. What a great job you did. Man, the field, it's beautiful. Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you have done all you were commanded, this is what we should say. We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Don't expect that God should be doing everything the way you think he should be doing because you're faithful. We should be faithful in the small things and watch him work out the big things. Too many believers in our culture, too many of us think that the world revolves around us. Listen to me, if I drop dead tomorrow, there'll be somebody here preaching that Sunday. And he'll do just as good a job, if not better. Don't ever think that God owes you more. I mean, I think Jesus is saying this because maybe there's a danger of the 12 getting carried away with transplanting trees. Like, hey, if you say they're like, you know how it is, and then they get focused on one thing. Oh, we can cast that. We'll say to that mulberry tree, go plant itself. And they miss the point. So he wants to make sure that they understand that they need to be faithful, that faith that does not result in faithfulness is never God's will. Faith, real faith, should always lead to faithfulness to accomplish God's work and God's will. God's way. God's work, his will, the way he wants it done. Because we're living by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And sometimes we believe we should have special privileges as believers. We think, well, we're God's children. Shouldn't life be easier for us? I mean, man, I've been praying for that Cadillac and it just hasn't come yet. But I'm holding out hope. I'm believing that that pink Cadillac's going to show up in my driveway because I have faith. Now, we are unworthy servants. We don't even deserve to be saved. The only reason we're saved is because he's poured out his grace and mercy on our lives. And that's big. Because that motivates us. I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 14, he says, the love of Christ compels me. NIV says compels. Uh, ESV says constrains me. The love of Christ compels me, for I am convinced that one died for all, and therefore all should live for the one who died. Man, he's motivated. He's compelled because of the love of Christ that saved him. And I hope that that's your heartbeat, that you are motivated, not for what anybody else says to you, what anybody else thinks about you, but for his glory and his glory alone. Our responsibility before God is to live in humility, to not think we deserve anything, and to humble ourselves before a holy God who saved us, who allows us to serve him. It's a privilege to serve 
our holy and awesome God. Is it not a privilege to serve him? It is a privilege. It's an honor. Sometimes we take it way too lightly. Privilege must always be balanced with responsibility. And the servant doesn't come in and say, hey, feed me now. I worked hard. (laughs) You know, he did his job. He comes in, and now he does more work. He prepares the food. He changes his clothes because he's dirty. And then he waits. Look, we just need to do what God has called us to do. Everybody. Everybody who follows Christ will get our reward. Remember what I said last week? For some people, this is the only heaven they'll ever experience. This is it. Man, they're getting their reward now. But for us who follow Christ, this is the only hell we're ever going to experience. Man, this is nothing compared to eternity. So let's be faithful. And it starts with the small things. Are you faithful in reading your Bible every day? Are you faithful in getting in the Word? That's a small thing, right? No, it's really a big thing. Are you faithful in being alone with Him in His presence? Singing to Him, praising Him. Are you meditating on His Word? Are you serving others? Are you giving your life away? Are you sharing? Are you faithful in the small things? Not just the big things, man, the the things that are so hard in life, but the little things. Are you witnessing? Telling people about Jesus. Are you sharing the gospel? When's the last time you sat down with somebody and shared the gospel? Just said, hey, man, I care about you because I care about you. I need to tell you that God sent his only son to become one of us. And he wrapped himself in flesh and laid down his life so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be reconciled to the Father. And if you put your faith in him, he will save you. He will wash away all your sins. He'll cast them as far as the east is to the west. He will forgive you. He will give you eternal life. In his son, Jesus Christ. See, we are crying out to God for the big things, and we're not even being faithful in the small things. And we're expecting that God should do all these great things for us because we've been so faithful. But the truth is we have to evaluate our own lives and realize, are we being responsible for what we've been given? Are you being responsible? I have to ask myself every day, am I being responsible with the things that God has charged me with, given to me? You've got to ask yourself, am I being responsible in the way I'm raising my kids? You know, I thought about that a lot yesterday. My son, Adam, is graduating, you know. This, I can't believe it. And I was sitting there yesterday while they were showing these video clips at his school. They had like a little dinner for all the kids that were graduating. Just, you know, from the time he was that big. And now he's going away and I'm thinking to myself, God, have I done a good job? Have I been a good example of Jesus? Because that's all that matters is does he see Jesus in me? That's all that's going to matter when he goes away to college. Whatever he does with his life, did he see Jesus in me? That's what matters. Was I faithful in the small things so that he could see the big picture? That's all that's going to matter when it's said and done. And it starts with us being right with God so that we can be right with the people around us. Will you pray with me? And then I'm going to give you your memory verse. Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy, God. Thank you for loving us and saving us. Thank you, God, for giving us the privilege of first knowing you. God, what an awesome privilege it is to know the creator of the universe. And then what a responsibility and privilege, God, to be your witness. There's no plan B or C. You, you called us to be a witness to the world, to our children, our family members and our friends and our coworkers of what it means to know you, Jesus. 
Forgive us, Lord, for the areas that we are falling short in. Reveal them to us that we might repent from them and make them right. I love you, Lord, and I know you love us. I know you love me. I know you brought us here together to grow in faith and in our knowledge of you that we might apply your word to our lives, that we might be a testimony to the world of what it really means to have a real relationship, a life-changing relationship with the king of this universe. Thank you for that privilege and that responsibility. In Jesus' name, amen.